Reese Witherspoon stars in the movie Sweet Home Alabama. As the movie starts, she's in New York City. She's a successful businesswoman, and she just looks like she belongs in New York City. It looks like she spent her entire life there. And then she needs to return back to where she grew up. And we find out where she grew up was a small town in Alabama. And as she returns home to Alabama, you see this collision within her of her New York City part and her roots from Alabama. And her southern roots start to reappear. You can hear it start to reappear with her accent. You could hear the phrases she's using as she's come back home. And at one point, um, that accent comes back, a phrase comes out, and someone looks at her and says, you can take the girl out of the South, but you can't take the South out of the girl. She thought she had left Alabama long ago, but there was still a lot of Alabama left in her. Israel, they're about to find out that even though it was difficult to leave Egypt, it might be even more difficult to get Egypt out of them. Israel, who went to Egypt because of a famine, Israel, Egypt would have saved them. They would have died if they didn't go to Egypt. But then they were there for 400 years. And it got worse and worse as the 400 years continued. At some point, they became slaves. The hard labor increased. It came to the point where there was such a paranoia about them that their sons were being killed at birth. They cried out to God. God heard their cries. And we see in the book of Exodus, the great saving act of the Old Testament. Moses is sent. There's the miraculous plagues that take place, culminating with the Passover. And they leave at that time of the Passover, and they not only leave the land, but they're given all of this, this gold and silver and other things to take with them at that time. They basically plunder the land as they go. They have the miraculous crossing of the Red Sea, where the Red Sea parts for them to walk throughout it. They live in the wilderness, where God miraculously provides for them with food and water. They go to Mount Sinai, where they spend a year and are given the law. And they get to that point, and they seem so ready to move forward into the promised land. They're standing right there, ready to enter. But there's something they don't realize yet. They're not in Egypt any longer, but they still have a lot of Egypt left in them. They were in Egypt 400 years the impact was much deeper than they realize. Our big idea today is this. Since your past impacted you more than you think, your healing will need to go deeper and will take longer than you expect. Since your past impacted you more than you think, your healing will need to go deeper and will take longer than you expect. So here we have Israel. They're standing on the edge of the promised land. Here we go. They're ready to enter. The Lord spoke to Moses in Numbers chapter 13. So we're in the book of Numbers, the fourth book in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And the Lord spoke to Moses, send men to scout out the land of Canaan I am giving to the Israelites. Send one man who's a leader among them from each of their ancestral tribes. So you have the 12 tribes of Israel. Here's what I want you to do, Moses. Pick one from each. So we're going to send 12 people in to spy out the land. 
12 spies to go into the land. Now notice what God says about the land. It is the land of Canaan that I am giving to you. See, it's a sure thing. You know, there's a time when a young man, young woman will be dating, and the young man might decide it's time to propose, to, to take the relationship to the next step, to ask her to marry him. Sometimes those proposals are total surprises, and that young man has absolutely no idea how she's going to respond. Now, in reality, there's a whole lot of proposals that take place where they've been ring shopping already where she's given every indication that if you get down on one knee, I, I can tell you what the answer is going to be ahead of time. And it's really a sure thing when he does that. She's made it very clear to him. This is a sure thing. I am giving you the land. And so Moses, said, as we jump down to verse 17, sent them to scout out the land of Canaan. So he has the 12 of them, go scout out the land. Go up uh, this way to the Negev and go up to the hill country. See what the land is like, whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. Is the land they live in good or bad? Are the cities they live in encampments or are they fortifications? Is the land fertile or unproductive? Are there trees in it or not? Be courageous. Bring back some fruit from the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. So go into this spy trip in the land, and as I was looking through this, I, I was wondering, why do you need a spy trip when it's a sure thing that you're going to get the land? If I'm thinking of a spy trip, I'm thinking we're going in and we're going to figure out, is this something we want to do or not? Right? Is it something we can accomplish? Is this going to work if we attack here, if we go into the land? If God's already told them it's a sure thing, why even do the spy trip? I think there's probably a couple reasons why God wanted to send them in. One is to build excitement. Let's look at what, what we're going into. Let's look at how great this land is. The other would be to develop further trust in God. It would be to give them the opportunity to say, yeah, look, it's an incredible land. Yeah, the people are big. We can't do it in our own strength, but with God we can because he's told us he's going to give us this land. And so into the land these spies go. They come to one of the valleys and they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, which was carried on a pole by two men. They also took some pomegranates and figs. At the end of 40 days, they returned from scouting out the land. So they go into the promised land and they decide, hey, let's take a cluster of grapes back. Now, I went to Fry's this week, and I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to buy a cluster of grapes that was big enough where I would need to have come on stage two men with poles to, to carry it out here. And, and um, spoiler alert, Fry's didn't have any grape clusters that size. That's how incredible the land is. They had to get two guys with poles to carry the grapes to get it back to show them what it was like. And can you imagine the excitement of the people? Um, they, they've spent this year out at Mount Sinai and the spies have gone in the land and 40 days has come back and they, the rumors start, the spies are back. The spies are back. There's their grapes. <laughs> so the spies came back with the excitement of the people and they go back to Moses and Aaron and the entire Israelite community in the wilderness they brought back a report for them and the whole community. They showed them the fruit of the land. Look at the two guys over there carrying the grapes. They reported to Moses, we went into the land where you sent us. It is flowing with milk and honey. Here's some of its fruit. However, the people living in the land are strong. The cities are large and fortified. Now here gives the chance. God has sent them in. How are they going to respond? Caleb's the one who speaks up. He gives the right answer. 
He quieted the people in the presence of Moses and said, let's go up now and take possession of the land because we can certainly conquer it. The size of the people doesn't matter. The fortification of the cities doesn't matter. This is our chance to trust in God. Unfortunately, there were 10 other spies that spoke up. They have a different opinion of what should happen next. The men who had gone up with him responded, we can't attack the people. They're stronger than us. So they gave a negative report to the Israelites about that land they had scouted. The land we pass through to explore is one that devours its inhabitants. All the people we saw in it are men of great size. We saw groups of people there that are huge. To ourselves, we seemed like grasshoppers. And we must have seen the same to them. As we're standing there and they're looking at us, we all realized one thing. <laughs> they're bigger. <laughs> I was thinking about times where you, you just know you're going to lose. I was thinking about, let's take a, a, a game we're going to have, and we invite an NFL team, and they're going to play a high school football team. And they both come out on the field, and, and the NFL team is huge. They have lots of experience. They're talented. They're strong. Their ability is, is vastly different. And as that high school football team sits there, they're like, we know you're going to beat us. You know you're going to beat us. We're just grasshoppers. We don't have what it takes to do this. See, the slavery in Egypt impacted them more than they knew. If I were predicting this, if I were reading this for the first time and thinking about what sin might they struggle with when they've gone through this incredible year, they're standing on the edge of the promised land ready to enter in. If I was going to predict what would happen next, if I was told they were going to commit some sin at this point, what I would anticipate would be to have them say, hey, look at us, we deserve this. Look what we've accomplished in the last year. Look what we've done. I would have anticipated some pride here. Instead, they were out of Egypt, but they were still thinking like they were slaves. They're better than you. They're bigger than you. That entire time, they were in slavery. They knew that there were people who were in control of them who were bigger and better than them that they could not beat. And so when they see someone stronger, we can't win that. And even though we have those two guys over there with the huge things of grapes, we don't deserve good things. For 400 years, it's been beat into us that we are just slaves. We do not deserve good things to happen to us. We're just grasshoppers. Everyone knows who we are. David Stubbs has said this, Israel rejects God not because they want to be more, but rather because they're willing to settle for less. So let's get real. I've been thinking about my own life as Pastor Scott's been leading us through this series thinking through the Egypt areas in my life. There's been an issue that's been lying dormant and then it pops up every so often and it's been popping up throughout this series. 
And I realize it's the Egypt thinking that exists in my head. A number of you probably know I was in ministry for 22 years. I was a youth pastor for a number of years and then sole pastor of a small church and then um, lead pastor of a mid-sized church for a number of years. And that last church was a tough church. It got to a point where I was regularly going to my doctor to have my heart checked because of chest pains. It got to a point where my wife was away in California and I had had a ministry confrontation and talking to her on the phone that night. And I said, right now, I feel like I'm on the ground and I can't get up. And right now, I don't even care if I get up. I had burned out at that point. Back when I started ministry, I'd hear about pastors that would burn out and really didn't pay much attention to it because I knew that would never be me. And there I was at that point. Eight years later, I realize I'm still carrying Egypt around with me. If you were to hear in my head, or if you'd hear conversations I might have with my wife or, or others, you would regularly hear phrases like, I'm a failure. If people really knew who I was, they wouldn't like me. And in entering this series, I've realized that that needs to be my focus right now, is to stop carrying Egypt around with me. I was thinking through as I do that, what are my fears as I enter that? And I'm not scared of whatever hard work there is to confront this. I'm not scared of any changes I may need to make in my thinking or in my life. Here's my fear that keep enters my head. See if you hear any Egypt thinking in this. What if I explore this and what I discover is that I'm right? What if I really am a failure? What if I don't have what it takes? Maybe it's possible that I am nothing more than a grasshopper. Egypt gets into your head. It changes your self-image. It alters your worldview. It transforms your heart and your mind. Like the person who was abused as a child. And as adult has opportunities for good relationships, but sabotages every one of them. Why? Because I don't deserve to be with someone who really loves me. Like the husband who's in a fight with his wife, and instead of engaging, he backs out and goes to work and starts working more and more and more. The mindset is, here's a place where I can thrive. I'm no good as a husband. I'm no good in a family. But at work, I could do a good job. And so on future nights when he comes home, the TV goes on to avoid engaging in conversation, to avoid any sense of intimacy with his wife. I'll settle for this. Like the person who feels inadequate because she's never been accepted as a child or all the way up and through life. She feels like she's living a lie. If people knew who I really was, they wouldn't like me. So she works hard to always succeed 
always be in control, always please everybody. I've got to keep juggling all the balls because that's what everyone expects. I can't drop any of this. Chuck DeGroat, who fittingly wrote the book, Leaving Egypt, says this. We compensate one way for another for the difficulties we experience early on in life, our Egypt time. And we find ourselves living under the power of slavery rather than entering into the life God offers. Since your past impacted you more than you think, your healing will need to go deeper and will take longer than you expect. Now, Pastor Scott's mentioned that not everyone's in Egypt right now. You might not be in Egypt right now. But everyone still has, as long as they're here on earth, some Egypt left in them, some Egypt thinking. Timothy Jones has said this, the great danger facing all of us is that someday we may wake up and find that always we've been busy with the huss and trappings of life and has really missed life itself. So if this is where I'm standing today, here's the question. How do I get Egypt out of me? Now I'm going to suggest to you today two things to not do and three things to do. At least these are things that I'm focusing on right now. First thing not to do. I need to not listen to others who confirm that I am a grasshopper. Numbers chapter 14 starts off, and it has the whole community breaking into loud cries. The people wept that night. All the Israelites complained about Moses and Aaron, and the whole community told them, if only we died in the land of Egypt. They've said that before. Now they add another phrase to it. If only we died in this wilderness. Wilderness is looking good. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to die by the sword? Our wives and our children are going to become plunder. Wouldn't it be better to go back to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's appoint a leader and go back to Egypt. See, you would have a huge majority at this point. You'd have many, many, many voices saying, no, let's not go this way. We don't know exactly how many people are are traveling with Israel at this point. Maybe um, Scott's thrown out a million or a little more, 1.5 million, two, two and a half million. Um, We don't know that. Let's just take the number two and a half million. At this point, it appears if there's two and a half million people with the Israelites, that there'd be 2,499,996 who'd be voting to go home, and there'd be four saying, let's go in. Moses, Aaron, Joshua, Caleb. The majority is voting the wrong way. (laughs) Just because someone says something about you doesn't make it right. I need to not listen to others who confirm that I'm a grasshopper. When I was transitioning out of the church and moving into law, I uh, worked for a while um, teaching classes at GCU in Bible and theology areas. And I got uh, feedback um, at the end of the semester, right? You'll get feedback from your students. And I got feedback, I remember, on one of the classes that the feedback was, I don't know why this person was chosen as a professor. He failed in ministry, and he's not serving there right now. I need to not listen to others who are confirming that I'm a grasshopper. Second thing not to do. I don't want to go back to Egypt. This was in verse 3 where they say, hey, let's go back to Egypt. Let's appoint a leader. Let's go back to Egypt. Let's get someone new here. Moses isn't cutting it. We need someone a better leader than Moses. Moses. You know, Egypt might be easier, but it's not better. 
And for me, the question isn't, do I want to go back to Egypt? It's, I don't want to stay where I am. I'm out of Egypt, but I don't want to stay stationary anymore. I don't want to stay where I am. I don't want to let Egypt keep me here. Chuck DeGroat has a great quote uh, about that um, uh, temptation. He says, faced with the daunting prospect of moving forward, of embracing a life of greater flourishing. So this is what you're, you're facing here as you deal with your Egypt, is that you have an opportunity to move forward. You have an opportunity to embrace a life with greater flourishing. We find ourselves losing hope. The sex addict returns to his favorite pornographic sites. The workaholic returns to his busy schedule, knowing that his schedule kills any chance of intimacy with his wife or connection with his children. The angry wife defaults to her husband's defensiveness, squelching his spirit. The abused woman returns to a relationship where she knows she'll be used rather than loved. The religious addict defaults to her legalistic ways, judging others rather than embracing the love God has for her, even in her failures. Over and over again, we choose to return to Egypt instead of daring to enter the promised land. We settle for less than the life for which God made us. I don't want to go back to Egypt. I don't want to stay where I am. I want to enter the life that God has created and desired for me to do. Two things not to do, three things to do. Number one, I am bold when I trust in God's promises. I am bold when I trust in God's promises. Numbers chapter 14 in verse 5, it says, uh, Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole assembly of the Israelite community. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, who are among those and scouted out the land, they tore their clothes. Um, so Joshua and Caleb are with them. I just love those guys. And they um, tear their clothes, and they said to the whole Israelite community, the land we passed through and explored is an extremely good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he'll bring us into the land, a land flowing with milk and honey. He'll give it to us. Don't rebel against the Lord. Don't be afraid of the people of the land. We'll devour them. I'm bold when I trust in the promises of God. I was thinking of some of the promises of God this week. One of them is that the moment I accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, he gave me the Holy Spirit who transforms my life. See, I make an assumption that if people saw who I really was, they would see something bad. Isn't it possible if we just believe what God says, let's just assume that what he says is true, just for the fun of it. Just for the sake of argument. Isn't it possible that if people saw who I really was, They would see a person whose life's been transformed because of the Holy Spirit's power within him. I was thinking of the promise of spiritual gifts, that if you're a believer that you've been given spiritual gifts, areas in which to minister and impact others. And if you're currently alive... then God still has purpose. He still has a reason he has you here. He still has a reason that I'm here. I'm bold when I trust in God's promises. Second, I'm confident when I remember that God is with me. And towards the very end of this section in Numbers uh, 14, 9 and 10, Um, It says, their protection's been removed, meaning the people of the land. The Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. And you've got this massive group on the one side, and and you've got um, the four people on, on the one side, and the whole Israelite community threatened to stone them. They were ready to stone Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb. 
And then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tent of the meeting. It's God's with them. God was with those four. I was thinking back to some of my favorite images um, when my kids were young. And one of them is that whenever we'd get to a street corner, whenever we'd come to a crosswalk, a little hand would pop up. <laughs> right? I need to hold dad's hand. I need to hold mom's hand. There was just this trust, just, just this, this picture of, of they wanted to walk with me through that intersection. That's a picture I have when I think of God walking with me. It's my hand going up. Yeah, I want to walk with you, God. If I ever thought that one of my kids was dealing with the issue that they thought they had failed me, that would break my heart. I adore my kids. I love them. I want to walk with them. And when God is with us, part of what he's done to make that possible is what took place at the cross when there was this incredible substitution that took place. And all of my sins were placed unto Jesus and the righteousness of Christ was placed unto me. Oh, failure is inevitable, and we need to allow grace to ourselves for our failures. But I am God's treasured possession. I'm confident when I remember that God is with me. Third thing, I have purpose when I fight for God's desires. This next section of the passage in Numbers 14 is great because the Lord talks to Moses in and he says, how long are these people going to despise me? How long will they not trust in me despite all the signs I performed among them? I mean, it's been a pretty good year. How long do I put up with them? Here's what I'm going to do, Moses. I'm going to strike them with a plague. I'm going to destroy them. Then I'll make you into a greater and mightier nation than they are. Now, they've made life hard for Moses that last year, too. So here's kind of the offer God's making. I'm going to destroy them. We're going to start fresh, me and you, and we'll go from there. If I were Moses, I might have been tempted by the offer. And yet Moses jumps in right away. And he says, no, 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 God, the Egyptians will hear about it. For by your strength you brought this people from them. They'll tell it to the inhabitants of the land. They've heard that you, Lord, are among these people, how you are seen face to face, how your cloud stands over them, how you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. If you kill this people with a single blow, the nations that have heard of your fame will declare, since the Lord wasn't able to bring this people into the land he swore to give them, he slaughtered them in the wilderness. God, your, your reputation, your fame your glory. See, when I'm a grasshopper, I'm just focused on me. I'm treading water. I'm staying where I am. When I'm healthy, I'm focused on God's plan. When I'm healthy, I'm thinking whatever God's doing in the world, I want to be part of that. Whatever God's doing in our community, I want in on that. I have purpose when I fight for God's desires. A couple next steps today. First one, name one area where you feel like you are a grasshopper. Where Egypt thinking has impacted your heart and your mind and you're carrying it with you. Name one area where you feel like you are a grasshopper. Second one, name one promise of God that you need to trust in. One promise of God. 
You say, this is what God said. And I'm just going to believe that it's true. One promise that you need to trust in. Final quote here. Raymond Brown said this. Self-doubt is a cruel and crippling emotion. It robs its victims of security, dignity, composure, and resourcefulness. To remain in cowering self-doubt is to distrust God. That's why I don't want to stay where I am. I am not a grasshopper. Heavenly Father, I pray for every one of us in this room right now. And I pray that as Egypt thinking has infected our hearts and our minds, that we would have the courage to say no more. The courage to believe in you. The courage to believe in what you've done in our lives. The courage to believe in your promises. The courage to trust in you for what you want to do in our lives, what you want to do tomorrow. May you use this series that Pastor Scott's leading us through to impact us. To refocus us on an unshakable faith in you. To believe that you brought us out of sin and slavery. To bring us in to something incredible. Transform our lives, God. Transform my life, God. Rid my mind and my heart of Egypt thinking. Whatever you're doing in the world, I want to be part of that, God. I want you to receive glory and honor and praise. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on my behalf. Thank you for taking my sin upon you. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. God, we love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.